All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Jason Kanner, and I'd like to welcome you all back for the second of our 2020 Harry Steenbach Lectures in Biochemistry. It is again my distinct pleasure to introduce Nobel Laureate, Dr. Bill Kalin, who again is the Sydney Farber Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and is also a senior physician scientist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So I'd first like to recognize Professor Kalin for what I think we can all agree was a phenomenal first seminar yesterday. I think really left us with some really critical take home points. And so for any that may have arrived a bit late yesterday, uh, it does appear that a recording of the lecture can now be found on the biochemistry website. Now, as I described in part yesterday, uh, Bill has deservedly amassed more accolades that I could possibly tell you about now, uh, but again, include his membership in both the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine, the Canada Gardner Award, the Lasker Award, and the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine that he was awarded just last year, jointly with Peter Ratcliffe and Greg Semenza. And so finally, I'd again really like to thank Professor Kalin for accepting our invitation to deliver this year's Steenbach Lectures and for offering all of us some fantastic advice and things to think about. I know we're really looking forward to this seminar this afternoon. And so now without further ado, again, as best as we can in this context, I'd ask you all to join me in welcoming back Dr. Bill Tate. Well, thank, thank you very much, Jason. Thank you for this uh, that very nice introduction. Uh, I wish I could be with you in person, but uh, hopefully this is the next best thing. And I'm honored to be giving these uh, Steenbach uh, lectures. In deciding what to talk about, looking back, if I'm really being honest, some of the best talks I ever went to, especially when I was younger, were talks that sort of laid out sort of the history of a line of investigation and how it had unfolded and what the thought processes were. And that was very helpful to me. So that's the kind of talk I'm gonna at least try to give. You know, having said that, I suffer from uh, this very common delusion that even though I'm too busy to read everybody else's papers, somehow magically people have read my papers and are just gonna roll their eyes at what I'm about to present because they're gonna view it as all historical and, and uh, you know, what have you done for me lately? But uh, if you'll forgive me, I think this is probably the better talk, especially for the young people. Uh, watching today. And so here's my disclosure slide. Uh, and here again are the people who've worked on von Hippel-Lindau disease in my laboratory over uh, the years. I've been more than lucky in terms of the number of talented people who've worked in my laboratory. And here's just a partial list of our very uh, talented and very generous uh, collaborators. Uh, so when I was uh, younger, uh, for a variety of reasons, I thought I was going to be a clinical doctor. So here I am at Johns Hopkins Hospital as an intern uh, in internal medicine in uh, 1983. Uh, my chairman when I was an intern was the great Victor McCusick, uh, who was really one of the fathers of modern uh, human genetics, at least human clinical genetics, and he taught me the power of human genetics. And he was also a bit of a medical historian, and he taught me to appreciate the work of people who had become, who had come before us. Uh, now, I was so sure I was gonna be a clinical doctor that I, I spent an extra year at Johns Hopkins as a uh, chief resident, uh, which was uh, wonderful for several reasons, not the least of which was I met my uh, late wife, Carolyn, during that uh, year, and we had a very happy uh, life together. Uh, I came to uh, Boston in 1987 to do a uh, oncology fellowship at the Dana-Farber, again, expecting to be a clinical doctor, but the person who changed my life was David Livingston, who was my postdoctoral uh, mentor. I had worked on the RB tumor suppressor gene in, uh, tumor suppressor gene in David's laboratory. And it was really David who taught me how to be a scientist, how to think like a scientist. Uh, and so I really owe him a great uh, debt. So I started my own laboratory in uh, 1992. I sort of uh, futzed around for a little while trying to figure out what I would work on that would start to distinguish me from my former mentor, David Livingston, whose lab was down the hallway from mine. And fortunately, this paper crossed my desk, I think in the summer of 1993, which was the cloning of the von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor gene. And for a variety of reasons I'm gonna share with you, I thought this would be a great problem uh, to work on. And as I mentioned, I had worked on another tumor suppressor gene namely the RB tumor suppressor gene in David's lab. So I thought I was well equipped to study uh, such a gene. Uh, so again, uh, I mentioned uh, you know, having a sense of medical history. So this story in hindsight uh, arguably begins with this paper in 1894 by Treacher Collins, uh, who had uh, described a brother and a sister, both of whom had unusual retinal lesions that we would now call either retinal angiomas uh, 
or retinal hemangioblastomas. Uh, these are vascular tumors of the retina uh, that are easiest to see if you inject the patient with a fluorescein dye. So this patient has a large retinal uh, hemangioblastoma. A similar family was described about a decade later by the German ophthalmologist uh, Eugen von Hippel. Uh, but the real uh, hero in the story was Arvin Lindau, who was a Swedish neuropathologist. And uh, being a neuropathologist, he, he appreciated that these retinal lesions were simply the tip of the iceberg and were often associated with hemangioblastomas of the cerebellum and spinal cord, as well as some tumors of other uh, organs. And so just to show you again what some of these would look like, on the upper left, I'm showing you the fundoscopic view of a patient with a VHL disease. So here for orientation is the optic nerve head. And this patient has a hemangioblastoma. Uh, here I'm showing you a fluorescein angiogram and a VHL patient with multiple small retinal hemangioblastoma. So at this point, they can usually be treated with a laser, but if they're, if they're neglected or in a very sensitive place, uh, they can go on to cause retinal detachment or blindness. Uh, but again, these retinal lesions are sometimes associated with hemangioblastomas of the cerebellum or spinal cord. So here's a patient with VHL disease who has on the sagittal MRI, a large cystic hemangioblastoma with the solid component enhancing here indicated with the L triangle. These patients can also develop tumors of some other uh, organs. So uh, for example, they can develop numerous renal cysts. So here the urologist has opened or unroofed a large renal cyst in a patient with VHL disease and they've discovered a clear cell renal cell carcinoma arising from the epithelial cells lining this cyst cavity. And clear cell renal cell carcinoma is the most common form of kidney cancer. So with uh, apologies to treat your Collins, this came to be known as von Hippel-Lindau disease. It affects about one in 35,000 people. Although the first uh, report was about a century ago, in hindsight, some families have been affected with this disease for many centuries. Uh, it's caused by loss of function germline mutations of the VHL tumor suppressor gene that resides on chromosome 3p25. I've mentioned the hemangioblastomas and the clear cell renal cell carcinomas. These patients can also develop uh, a, a tumor called paraganglioma, uh, which when it arises in the adrenal gland is referred to as a pheo chromocytoma and a few other tumors. And I highlight in red clear cell renal cell carcinoma because hemangioblastomas and pheochromocytomas are uh, interesting, but admittedly pretty rare. Uh, whereas clear cell renal cell carcinoma, I mentioned is the most common form of kidney cancer. And kidney cancer is one of the 10 most common cancers in the developed world. So I thought if nothing else, studying the VHL gene would give us an opportunity to learn something about a common cancer, namely uh, kidney cancer. Now, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, uh, I mentioned VHL disease is caused by germline mutations that inactivate the VHL tumor suppressor gene. Uh, so in this schematic, it's the maternal allele uh, of the VHL gene that's been altered or has been uh, inactivated by a mutation. Uh, but initially these people are okay because they have one uh, remaining wild type allele from mom or dad. In this schematic, it's from dad. Uh, but the, the problem is they have about a 90% chance that at least one susceptible cell in their eye or brain or kidney, for example, uh, will lose spontaneously the remaining wild type allele. And that's the cell that can go on to form a tumor. Now, as you would predict from the knowledge that germline VHL mutations pred uh, predispose to, for example, kidney cancer, if you now look at non-hereditary clear cell renal cell carcinomas, you again see that biallelic inactivation or loss of the VHL gene is a common feature. Uh, but here, both uh, mutational events or hits, if you will, occur somatically in contrast to VHL disease where the first hit has occurred in the germline. Uh, now, I've already mentioned the vascular nature of these retinal hemangioblastomas, but another old clinical saw is that kidney cancers are notoriously rich in blood vessels. In fact, in the pre-CAT scan era, the diagnostic procedure of choice in patients suspected of having a kidney cancer was to do a renal angiogram and to look for the characteristic appearance of new blood vessels <coughs> throughout the kidney. And I should point out that at this time, there was tremendous interest in trying to develop angiogenesis, angiogenesis inhibitors to treat cancer uh, based in part on the pioneering work of uh, Judith Pokeman. And uh, I, I liked the idea, but I thought if we were gonna develop angiogenesis inhibitors, we really needed to understand the molecular circuits controlling angiogenesis. And so it seemed like studying the VHL gene might also provide insights into the molecular control of uh, angiogenesis. Now, another clinical curiosity about these tumors seen in VHL disease is that they sometimes stimulate excess red blood cell production. Uh, leading to what you can 
refer to as secondary polycythemia or perineoplastic or erythrocytosis. So normally if you take blood and spin it down in the capillary tube, about 40% of the volume should be the red cells themselves. But in uh, polycythemia, uh, now the hematocrit gets increased because you have too many red blood cells. And uh, back when I was a chief resident, I would memorize lists like this. So this is, these are the causes of excess red blood cell production. So clearly some of these are adaptive, such as if you live at high altitude or you have certain chronic heart or lung conditions. So here having more red blood cells helps you to deliver oxygen more efficiently. But some tumors are also uh, on this list. Some tumors can also stimulate red blood cell production. And it had always struck me as odd that the three tumors seen in VHL disease make this list, especially considering that hemangioblastomas and pheochromocytomas are otherwise relatively uh, rare. And so taking this uh, together, it struck me that VHL associated tumors were highly angiogenic, and we now know that's because they overproduce vascular endothelial growth factor. And I just told you they can stimulate red blood cell production, and that's because they can ectopically produce erythropoietin. And what these two responses have in common is that they would normally be seen if a tissue wasn't getting enough oxygen. If you weren't getting enough oxygen, you would try to increase oxygen delivery by increasing blood vessel formation and increasing red cell mass. And so uh, if I got one thing right, it was, uh, surmising that uh, studying the VHL gene uh, would provide clues into how cells and tissues in our body sense and respond to changes in oxygen since it seemed like the sensing had gone awry in these various uh, tumors. Now, this is an old fashioned experiment. This is for the young people, how we used to measure uh, mRNA abundance and the so-called Northern blot uh, assays. So here, what I'm showing you are Northern blots using radio labeled probes for uh, VEGF the PDGFB chain and GLUT1, all of which were well-studied hypoxia-inducible or hypoxia-regulated genes. Uh, the trick was to grow the cells under low oxygen or high oxygen conditions and then harvest RNA and do these northern blots. So for orientation, let's start with HEP3B cells. So HEP3B cells are, are VHL uh, proficient and they're a workhorse cell line in the hypoxia-inducible gene field. And you can see that these three mRNAs accumulated, but only if the cells were made hypoxic, hence hypoxia-inducible mRNA. So that was expected. But now on the left, let's look at a VHL null or defective renal cell carcinoma line, uh, as was done here by Othan Eliopoulos and Andrew Levy. Uh, so here you can see that the, now these hypoxia-inducible mRNAs accumulated whether oxygen was available or not. And this was specific because when Othan Eliopoulos uh, restored the function of the VHL gene by stable transfection, as he did here with three independent subclones, restoring the function of the VHL gene restored the regulation of these hypoxia-inducible mRNAs. And this was specific because if he instead introduced a cDNA for a tumor-derived mutant VHL, or in this case, uh, introduced an, an empty vector without a VHL cDNA, uh, now uh, he still saw a constitutive high-level expression of these hypoxia-inducible mRNA. So summarizing this finding, uh, what Othan Eliopoulos in the lab had really done was he had isogenic cells where the VHL protein was present or was absent or defective. He grew them under low oxidant or high oxidant conditions. And what I just told you is when he measured hypoxia-inducible mRNAs, he found that in the VHL defective cells, they produced high levels of hypoxia-inducible mRNAs even when oxygen was abundant. So in other words, this was the first demonstration that loss of the VHL protein uncoupled oxygen availability from the production of these hypoxia-inducible mRNAs. Now, in parallel, we did biochemical studies, uh, Adam Keibel, Kim Lonergan, and others in my lab, and they showed that the VHL protein uh, binds to a long in C and a long in B in Col2. And that turned out to be a big break in the story because what I didn't tell you was that the primary sequence of the VHL protein offered no clues as to what it might do. Uh, but it was uh, my now colleague, Steve Elledge, who pointed out that a long in C looks like a yeast protein called SKIP1, and Col2, a member of the Cullen family, looks like a yeast protein called CDC53. And Stephen's work and Ray Deshaies' work and others had shown that these two proteins, when bound to a so-called F-box protein, generate an SCF-like ubiquitin ligase that can target other proteins for destruction. And so by analogy, we began to think that maybe the VHL protein was uh, likewise the substrate recognition subunit of a ubiquitin uh, ligase complex. 
I should also point out that there are two hotspots for mutations in the VHL protein and VHL disease, the alpha domain, which we could show was responsible for recruiting the other members of the complex, and the beta domain, which we hypothesized was the substrate uh, docking site. And this idea was strengthened further by uh, X-ray crystallographic studies that we did with Nicola Pavlovich. So then the $64 question was, well, what is the substrate of this putative ligase? And a good, a good candidate was the HIF transcription factor because it was known from the work of Greg Semenza, Peter Radcliffe, Jaime Caro, Frank Bunn and others that the HIF transcription factor was a master regulator of these various hypoxia inducible mRNAs such as VEGF and EPO. And we knew that it consisted of an unstable alpha subunit that was normally degraded in the presence of oxygen and a constitutionally stable beta subunit which is often referred to by the alternative name of ARNT. And so uh, at this point, we were lucky because uh, Greg, uh, excuse me, Peter Radcliffe uh, published a paper in Nature showing that in fact, uh, cells lacking the VHL protein are unable to destroy HIF alpha under high oxygen conditions. And so based on that clue, we immediately showed that as we had suspected, this in fact is the ubiquitin ligase for the HIF alpha subunits and targets them for proteasomal degradation when oxygen is present. Whereas when oxygen levels are low or the VHL protein has been mutated, now HIP alpha can accumulate and dimerize with orange and activate genes such as VEGF and EPO. So that was very gratifying because it explained why uh, uh, tumors lacking the VHL protein would overexpress things like VEGF and EPO. But as you hope happens in science, having answered one question, we now were faced with a bigger question, which is how does the VHL protein know, if you will, whether oxygen is or is not available and hence whether it should destroy uh, HIF alpha. Uh, and since this is a biochemistry talk and since these are some of my favorite experiments of all time, I'm just gonna show you a couple of the experiments that were actually uh, informative in this regard. So this is an experiment that was done by Hei-Feng Yang when he was in the lab. So he took TS20 mouse fibroblasts, which are VHL proficient but they have a temperature sensitive mutation in the E1 ubiquitin activating enzyme. So when, so when you shift these cells to the restrictive temperature, polyubic relation will stop. So the trick here was to grow them under the permissive or the restrictive temperature. But in the case of the restrictive temperature, he grew them under high oxidant or low oxidant conditions. So in the bottom blot, I'm showing you an anti-HIF1 alpha immunoblot. And you can see that HIF1 alpha accumulates at the restrictive temperature as you would expect because under the restrictive temperature, polyubic relation will cease. But the informative experiment is the top filter. So in the top filter, Haping did a so-called far western blot where he incubated the nitrocellulose filter with recombinant VHL protein, actually together with along and B and C. And then he uh, detected the bound VHL after washing with an anti-VHL antibody. And here you could see First of all, that VHL could bind directly to HIF1 alpha, which frankly wasn't known at that time. So that was a, an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, but secondly, you could see that VHL would only bind to the HIF1 alpha that had accumulated in the presence of oxygen, but not the HIF1 alpha that had accumulated uh, under low oxygen conditions, even though there's comparable amounts of HIF1 alpha present. And so that said that the signal was going through HIF1 alpha, which was not known at that time. Uh, and finally, since this interaction survived a boiling in SDS and running through a gel and being slapped on a nitrocellulose filter, we could also surmise that the binding region in HIF1 alpha would likely be peptidic. And that turned out to be true. So Mircha Ivan in the lab actually then mapped the minimal region of HIF1 alpha that was sufficient to bind to VHL. And as we predicted, it was a peptide. In fact, he could get it down to a 25 mer peptide that had at its core the sequence MLIP YIPM. So he made this 25 mer as a biotinylated peptide that he captured on streptavin and agarose, and then did pull down studies with S35 labeled VHL protein made by in vitro translation. But he noticed this peptide only acquired the ability to bind to VHL if it was first pre-incubated with a mammalian uh, cell extract, uh, at, I think it was 30 degrees for an hour or so, presumably because the mammalian cell extract would then provide the modifying activity that was necessary to modify this peptide such that it could now capture VHL. 
So uh, now we got lucky here because Jaime Caro, who had been doing linker scanning mutagenesis of HIP1 alpha, had already shown that if you replace these eight residues in HIP1 alpha with eight consecutive alanines, that HIP1 now became constitutively stable. So uh, Mercha made the 25 merpeptide with now these eight residues re uh, replaced with these eight alanines, and now it wouldn't bind to VHL. He then did an alanine scan, and it turned out that two of the critical residues where this uh, proline residue shown here and not shown here, this leucine. So here I'm showing you if you mutate the proline to an alanine, now you don't bind. So then we look for examples of enzymes that might modify proline and might in principle be oxidant sensitive. And also uh, we had shown that iron chelators could block the interaction between HIP and VHL. And it was known that iron chelators could mimic a hypoxic response. So we added in, are there examples of enzymes that can modify proline that can potentially be oxidant sensitive and iron sensitive. And we learned about uh, certain prolyl hydroxylases. So we made a guess. We guessed that the modification was prolyl hydroxylation. So Mircha made this peptide so that now the proline was already pre-hydroxylated. And now you can see this peptide captures VHL, but now it no longer needed the pre-incubation step, presumably because we've already introduced the relevant uh, modification. And uh, so this was one of those, you know, once a decade or so Eureka experiments where you're running up and down the hallway and jumping up and down and doing high fives. But I always tell my postdocs uh, before gravitating to the most interesting explanation, which in this case would be that we have now discovered the modification. Think about uninteresting explanations. And so if you think about it, there would be some uninteresting explanations for this result. So one un uninteresting explanation would be that this is just a sticky peptide that would have bound to any S35 labeled protein. We just happened to look at uh, VHL. So that would not be a very interesting explanation for this result. So to get around this, uh, Billy Kim in the lab uh, did an experiment where rather than adding S35 labeled VH, VHL made by in vitro translation, he labeled mammalian cells with S35 that on the left were VHL proficient and on the right were VHL defective. On the left, these cells are ectopically expressing an HAVHL. Uh, and you can see now when he did the pull down with the hydroxylated peptide, that this is exquisitely specific. You get VHL along in B, along in C, Col2, uh, a couple other interesting proteins we're not gonna talk about. So this is exquisitely specific. So now we could at least say this was a specific interaction. It wasn't non-specific. Uh, the other uninteresting explanation would be that uh, either the modification really is prolyl hydroxylation or that prolyl hydroxylation mimics the authentic in vivo oxidant dependent modification. And so to address that, first of all, we did mass spec, which is the high tech way, I suppose, of showing that it was prolyl hydroxylation and it showed that HIP1 alpha is hydroxylated in vivo. But the low tech uh, solution was as follows. So uh, Mircha had already shown that if you produce HIP1 alpha by in vitro translation using reticlysate, it combined to VHL. And we now know that retic lysate contains the necessary prolyl hydroxylase. Whereas if he made HIF1 alpha in a wheat germ extract, it would not bind to VHL. And that's because wheat germ lacks the, the, the modifying activity. So what Mircha Ivan did here was he in vitro translated HIF1 alpha in the presence of tritiated proline so that the prolines would be radioactive. He then hydrolyzed the, the protein to completion and separated the amino acids by TLC with appropriate standards. And he could see uh, that when he made HIF1 alpha and reticlysate, he could see both uh, proline, but he could also see now hydroxylated proline. Uh, so the answer turned out to be that in the presence of oxygen, uh, HIF1 alpha gets uh, hydroxylated on one of two prolyl residues. And the same conclusion was reached in parallel by uh, Sir Peter Radcliffe's uh, group. Uh, so uh, this was very exciting. Uh, it immediately begged the question, uh, what enzyme is doing the work? Uh, we thought we were well positioned to purify the enzyme biochemically. So we teamed up with Joan and Ron Conaway. Uh, I already told you that rabbit reticulocyte lysate contained the hydroxylase activity. So we partially purified the hydroxylase using old fashioned you know, column chromatography. And then we monitored which fractions contain the hydroxylase based on their ability to hydroxylate that biotinylated peptide as determined by capture of S35 labeled VHL. And so we arrived at the prolyl hydroxylase of Eglin 1. Uh, as we were putting the paper together, uh, Peter Ratcliffe's group and Stephen McKnight's group 
using genetic approaches in worms and flies uh, came basically to the same uh, answer. So at least we got the right answer. So the answer was that the enzymes here are the EGLN, prolohydroxylases. They're sometimes referred to as the PhD prolohydroxylases. Uh, this mechanism it's turned out to be very uh, simple and elegant compared to some of the models that were prevailing at the time. So these enzymes split molecular oxygen and use one of the oxygen atoms to hydroxylate hip alpha. Uh, fortunately, uh, they have very low oxygen affinities and so they're very sensitive to changes in oxygen availability in a physiologically relevant range. This is in contrast to, for example, the collagen prolohydroxylases that have very high oxygen affinities. Uh, they require iron, which explains the iron chelator result. And they also require a co-substrate called 2-oxyglutarate or alpha-ketoglutarate, uh, which gets decarboxylated uh, to succinate and hence couples this reaction to uh, metabolism as well. Now, there are three members of this family, Eglin-1, Eglin-2, and Eglin-3, with the alternative names shown here. But by all criteria, the major workhorse regulator of HIP is Eglin-1. And perhaps for that reason, you can't make it through mouse embryogenesis without uh, Eglin-1. And so to circumvent this embryonic lethality, Andy Minamishma in the lab made mice where he could conditionally inactivate Eglin-1 in adult mice using a fluxed Eglin-1 allele and an inducible creed that can be activated with tamoxifen. And when he did that, the mice developed a massive polycythemia. Actually, the, the first hint of this was the paws here were getting slightly too red and the vessels were engorged. But these animals are developing uh, polycythemia. And about the same time, uh, work from Frank Lee, Joseph Raquel, and others taught us that certain families around the world that develop excess red blood cell production on a genetic basis have mutations in this pathway. Some have homozygous or less commonly compound heterozygous hypomorphic VHL mutations, so-called Chivash polycythemia. Others have hypomorphic Eglon 1 mutations, and yet others have hypermorphic HIF2 alpha mutations. And I should also point out that uh, adaptive, poly po adaptive polymorphisms in this pathway have also been identified in uh, humans that have adapted to life at high altitude, uh, such as the Tibetan. So there's pretty good evidence that this is the oxygen sensing pathway, uh, at least with respect to red blood cell production. Now, you might ask, why don't those families look like BHL disease? Why aren't they conspicuously cancer prone? Uh, and I think it's because the genetics here are slightly different. So let's on the left think about a kidney tumor, which is going to be effectively VHL null. Uh, if it's a sporadic tumor, the, the, the host is VHL plus over plus. If this is in the setting of VHL disease, uh, the individual has a defective VHL allele, but there's no evidence for haploinsufficiency for the VHL gene. So the, the, most of the cells are going to be fine, at least with respect to regulation of HIP, which I'm showing you schematically here. So here we have very high levels of HIP, but it's confined to a, a clone that's emerged uh, that's effectively uh, VHL uh, null. In contrast, in the familial polycythemia situations, uh, the, the defect is present in the germline and every cell in the body that could be making slightly too much EPO is making slightly too much EPO. And when measured, uh, these mutations lead to a very subtle but measurable increase in HIP. So this is a small defect in HIP but measured times many cells. This is a bigger defect in HIP but confined to a particular clone or clones. Now, going back to this model, uh, the polycythemia in these mice, not surprisingly, is being driven by EPO. And all of the EPO that we can detect in these mice is coming from the kidney. And that's not surprising because in the adult, it's the kidney, which is the major source of EPO. But that's not true during fetal life. During fetal life, it's the liver that makes EPO. And then shortly after birth, the hepatic EPO locus gets silenced. And then the kidney takes over. And this has both economic and medical implications. So for example, there are about 20 million Americans with chronic renal failure and two to 4 million of these are chronically anemic. So uh, Andy Minamishma wanted to know whether you, you could somehow reawaken the hepatic EPO locus in an adult uh, uh, mammal. So what he did was he created mice where he knocked out the prolohydroxylases uh, in, the, in, in the mouse liver either singly or in every pairwise combination or he knocked out all three. For comparison, he also knocked out VHL. He then measured hepatic EPO mRNA in the black bars and circulating serum EPO in the white bars. And what he saw was when he knocked out all three, he got a very robust uh, reawakening or induction of hepatic EPO production. Uh, not shown here is when he knocked out Eglin 1, at least transitly, you got a blip of EPO, but then it went back down because of compensation by the other paralogs. And so basically, 
depending on what you want to do, you can either cause a pulse of EPO or you can have a high steady state of production of EPO. Uh, now these enzymes turn out potentially to be druggable. And in fact, we reached out to a company called Fibrogen about 20 years ago. They were making small molecule inhibitors of the collagen prolohydroxylases as potential antifibrotics. And so they were making a number of two oxalate uh, competitive inhibitors of the collagen prolohydroxylases. And we reached out and asked whether we could test whether some of their compounds might fortuitously inhibit the hip prolohydroxylases. Because if we did, we thought that would be a good starting point for making specific inhibitors of the hip prolohydroxylases. So here's an early tool compound, FG4497 that was added to cells in culture. And you see this nice induction of HIP1 alpha. Mikhail Safran in the lab had made a reporter mouse that ubiquitously expresses a HIP1 alpha luciferase fusion protein that contains at least the business end of HIP1 alpha that's sufficient for oxygen independent regulation. And she gave this tool compound to the mice by oral gravage. And you could see that uh, HIP was being stabilized as determined by increased uh, light emission from these mice. Eventually, uh, this gave rise uh, through additional medicinal chemistry efforts at Fibrogen to a compound called Roxidustat, uh, which is a first in class inhibitor of the hip prolohydroxylases. And I should mention I have a financial conflict of interest again in Roxidustat. But here I'm showing you data from a phase two trial in patients with chronic kidney failure uh, who were treated with this orally available uh, hip stabilizer. So in blue, I'm showing you plasma EPO levels in the individuals got Roxidustat compared to the placebo in red. There's no evidence of pharmacological tolerance. You can bring the patients back in a month and dose them again and turn EPO on or off at will. As you would hope, this translates into an improvement in hemoglobin production, a measure of red blood cell mass, uh, even in patients, frankly, who are EPO refractory. Uh, for a variety of reasons, the phase three trials in China were finished before some of the phase three trials in the West, although those trials have now been completed as well. And uh, Roxidustat has now been approved for the treatment of anemia and chronic kidney failure in China and Japan. And the uh, US so-called PDUFA date is uh, December 20th of this year. So hopefully we'll learn by the end of the year. Uh, but there are a number of these drugs uh, that have advanced to phase three uh, testing. And so hopefully some of them will actually turn out to be uh, useful for patients with anemia. Now, one thing that's very, very gratifying is having discovered this system uh, it turns out that every uh, multicellular animal on the planet is using this system. So here I have a slide I borrowed from Peter Ratcliffe, where I'm showing you the conservation of the HIF family. Uh, he prefers the PhD nomenclature for the prolohydroxases and BHL. Uh, we're not going to talk about FIH today. Uh, but you can see all multicellular animals have this system. Uh, as often happened with genes during evolution, there were some gene duplication events, which gave this system some added richness. Uh, but this is the system that uh, multi multicellular animals on the planet are using to sense and respond to changes in oxygen, at least in terms of uh, large scale changes in gene expression. Now, presumably the selection pressure here is not to cause VHL disease. The selection pressure is to have a system that would allow you to survive in a low oxygen uh, environment if you were faced uh, with that insult or situation. And so just based on teleological arguments, we wondered whether uh, these drugs that inhibit EGLN or PHD prolohydroxylases would also be uh, useful in various diseases that are characterized by impaired oxygen delivery, such as heart attack or stroke. And that's certainly true in preclinical uh, models. Uh, so we and others have uh, modeled this in, uh, for example, rodents. Here I'm showing you data from Ben Olinchak and Java Moslehi in my lab, where uh, here using that uh, inducible uh, Cree system and the flox Eglin one they've acutely inactivated Eglin one at the time of an experimental myocardial infarction in mice. And here on the y-axis, I'm showing you, showing you the amount of heart muscle damage after occluding a major coronary artery and releasing it. So uh, using either here a genetic tool or not shown here pharmacological tools, they see substantial protection. So uh, we are hopeful that maybe someday these drugs will also be useful for the treatment of ischemic diseases. So I'm now going to put my cancer biology hat back on, which on one level is where I started. So let's now return to the role of VHL in cancer. So uh, let's look at, for example, kidney cancer. So again, patients with VHL disease are effectively VHL heterozygotes, but I already told you there's no evidence for haploinsufficiency of the VHL gene. So then what happens over time is they can develop numerous renal cysts. And when I examine these cysts 
are lined by epithelial cells that are BHL null. So apparently, at least in the human kidney, BHL loss causes preneoplastic renal cysts. And then over years to decades, they can develop uh, renal cell carcinomas of the clear cell type. And when examined, uh, these tumors have stereotypical mutations involving other genes. Presumably, these reflect cooperating events. So uh, one conclusion from this experiment of nature is that BHL loss, even if it's a, a critical step in renal carcinogenesis, is not sufficient for renal carcinogenesis. And it also says that BHL loss can be the initiating event, or some would call it the truncal event. But of course, here the deck was rigged because the person had a germline BHL mutation. So what about a sporadic clear cell renal cell carcinomas? Well, here a very similar picture emerges, and this is based on the work of Charlie Swanton and co-workers who have taken kidney tumors and done multiple spatially distinct biopsies of those tumors, including one possible of metastatic deposits, and then have done deep sequencing and have used mutant allele frequencies to infer the evolutionary histories of those tumors. And almost invariably, they see that inactivation of the BHL gene is the initiating or truncal event, and that there are then these later cooperating events that often occur in a subclonal or branching uh, pattern. So it appears whether you're a hereditary kidney cancer or a uh, sporadic kidney cancer, loss of BHL is, the, is sort of the gatekeeper. So by the time you're a clear cell renal cell carcinoma, does VHL function even matter anymore? And so to address that, Othon Iliopoulos in the lab took VHL null renal carcinoma cell lines. He restored the function of the VHL protein, and he saw that uh, these cells could still grow on a plastic dish, but they lost the ability to form tumors. So then to address the role of HIF, Keiji Kondo took these cells, and he introduced into these cells a version of uh, HIF alpha, and in particular HIF2 alpha, that couldn't be recognized by the VHL protein because the proline hydroxylation sites had been converted to alanine. And this restored the ability of these cells to form tumors. Conversely, when he took these cells and eliminated HIF2 alpha, initially using short hairpin RNA technology, and later we did this with CRISPR, uh, once again, these cells can grow pretty well on plastic, but they lose the ability to form tumors. And this is really a specific property of HIF2 alpha. In fact, when we did analogous experiments with HIF1-alpha, if anything, HIF1-alpha had the opposite effects, which led us kicking and screaming to the idea that at least in this context, uh, HIF2-alpha is acting like an oncoprotein and HIF1-alpha is acting as a tumor suppressor. And in fact, in some kidney cancers, you can't even detect HIF1-alpha expression. So what can we do about this? Well, I already told you that it was known that HIF was a regulator of VEGF and a number of companies fortunately were making VEGF inhibitors by the 90s. And we argued if they were gonna work in any solid tumor, they would work in kidney cancer. Uh, it was very gratifying to see these data from Genentech where on the Y axis, I'm showing you a measure, measure of VEGF production. And along the X axis, I'm showing you uh, different tissues. And in green are the VEGF levels in the normal tissues and in red are the uh, VEGF levels in the tumors derived from those tissues. So it is true that VEGF is modestly elevated in a variety of solid tumors, but that's because most solid tumors contain regions that are hypoxic. But the 800 pound gorilla is kidney cancer where VEGF goes through the ceiling. Presumably this reflects the fact that from the earliest days of carcinogenesis, VHL was lost, HIP was upregulated and hence VEGF was upregulated. And presumably that led to decreased selection pressure to turn on alternative or collateral uh, angiogenic uh, pathways. So in fact, we now have seven VEGF inhibitors approved for the treatment of kidney cancer, and that's been very gratifying. Uh, but some patients don't respond, and even those patients who do respond will eventually uh, progress or relapse. So how can we do better? So just based on first principles, you might argue, well, uh, why, why target any one HIF target gene? Why not just target HIF itself? And based on what I told you, why not target uh, HIF2? But unfortunately, the conventional dogma at the time was that HIF2 was not druggable. But fortunately, Rick Bruick and Kevin Gardner ignored that, and they identified a druggable pocket in HIF2-alpha. They also developed or identified chemical scaffolds that could bind to this pocket, and in so doing, induce an allosteric change, such that HIF2-alpha would no longer uh, bind to orange and hence could no longer bind to DNA. They then outlicensed these uh, scaffolds to Peloton, and they did medicinal uh, chemistry to make PT2399, uh, uh, which is a, a more potent, more specific, more bioavailable HIF2-alpha inhibitor. They were kind enough to share it with us in pre and we used it in preclinical models and showed that this compound could decrease HIF dependent mRNAs, could decrease proliferation ex vivo, and could decrease orthotopic tumor assays. And I think I showed this yesterday, but you know, here's an example of such an experiment where Chin Cho in the lab took a renal carcinoma cell line that was VHL defective, 
and treated them with 0.2 or 2 micromolar PT2399. And she saw a decrease in soft agar growth. But again, how would you know this is on target? Maybe this is just some noxious poison that inhibits HIF2, but also does many other things. And this is really a, uh, just a toxicity effect. Well, the way, as we discussed yesterday, to deal with that is to do a rescue experiment. And here we were aided by Bruick and Gardner who had identified a point mutation in HIF2 alpha that would prevent uh, these drugs from binding to the pocket, such drugs from binding to the pocket, but would otherwise leave HIF2 alpha intact. And so that allowed uh, Chin in my lab to really do the experiment this way, where using CRISPR, she generated isogenic VHL defective renal carcinoma cells that were expressing wild type HIF2 alpha for this drug resistant variant. And with the drug resistant variant, you can see that now these cells continue to grow in soft agar assays, uh, despite the uh, presence of the compound. So this said that this and the other effects we were measuring were on target. Uh, eventually a clinical trial uh, occurred with the, what is now the most current version of the HIF2 inhibitor. Uh, these were patients with advanced kidney cancer who had failed multiple lines of therapy. 90% of them had failed a VEGF inhibitor and 70% had failed a uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor. These are so-called swimmers plots where each horizontal bar is a patient and how long they were on study at the time of this analysis. So for orientation, here's one year on therapy. The patients with the black arrows were doing well at the time of this analysis. And the patients with the yellow stars had achieved a partial response by resist criteria. So at least some of the patients seem to be benefiting. And based on this, the drug has gone into phase three testing, uh, but some of the patients were not benefiting and we're trying to understand this. Now, I mentioned these were heavily pretreated patients and you might've wondered how might this drug have fared if it had been used more in a frontline setting or had been used in patients who didn't have such advanced disease. And we were fortunate that we were able to convince Peloton to also test this HIF2 alpha inhibitor in patients, which is now called MK6482, by the way, now that it's been acquired by Merck, in patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease who had not been treated medically before. To be on this study, these patients had to have measurable renal tumors that were currently being monitored in careful surveillance programs in an attempt to delay or prevent the need for repeated partial nephrectomies. So you had to have a measurable kidney tumor, but you could have incidentally hemangioblastomas of the eye and brain. You could have pancreatic lesions, other lesions. Uh, and so these data were presented by Eric Yonash and colleagues at ASCO this year, but I'm pleased to report that 87% of the patients had some measurable uh, tumor shrinkage of their kidney tumors. Uh, about 40% had a confirmed partial response or a partial response awaiting independent confirmation. The, progress, the median progression-free survival has not been reached and the 12-month progression-free survival is 98.3%. And I should also point out that responses were seen in some of the hemangioblastomas and some of the other incidental uh, tumors. And so now this is what the uh, swimmer's plot looks like for the VHL population. Uh, you can see now that it looks like at this analysis, most patients are doing pretty well on therapy and most have passed uh, the one year mark. Uh, frankly, even before the data were presented, I knew that things were going in the right direction because some of the patients were posting their findings on the social media sites. So here, for example, is a patient saying, I never thought I'd see this day, describing that some of their tumors were getting smaller or in some cases uh, had disappeared. And frankly, these patients have been living with the sort of Damocles over their neck for years, having watched other members of their family over time suffer from this disease. So this has been really very gratifying. Uh, everybody loves a video, so I'm going to share a video that was uh, sent to me. Hey, everybody, it's Justin, and I just wanted to give you a quick update. I am in a gondola right now in uh, Taiwan. Over there is Taipei 101. Uh, the gondola is actually right by the Taipei Zoo. But I just wanted to give you a quick update and uh, say I'm doing well. I'm enjoying my trip. If it wasn't for the PT2977 drug trial, I would have never been able to come out here and do what I'm doing right now. Um, so I just want to thank Peloton and I hope Merck will fast track this drug for a VHL treatment. Um, so if you guys are listening, hopefully you guys will put it on the market to help VHL. But uh, yeah, keep uh, watching these videos. I'll be making more and I'll, I'll get better at it and I have to get the angles right because it kind of looks fat, you know? <laughs> I love that because at that age, that's the kind of thing you should be worried about. You should be worried about whether you look fat in your vlog and not what you're not being worried about what your ne next CAT scan looks like. Uh, you know, so hopefully today I've shared a couple examples of things that actually got uh, translated. But one of the things that I'm very concerned about is I think there's just too much 
emphasis, frankly, on uh, translation. I think we should be in the knowledge generation business. So, you know, I think real translation happens not when you put a gun to someone's head and say, go translate. Uh, real translation happens when you actually understand something well enough that you've created an opportunity to do something good. So uh, I call this the translational moment. Uh, so for example, uh, think about all the things that had to be learned before we got to Gleevec for the treatment of CML. We had to learn about the Philadelphia chromosome. We had to clone the BCR ABLE uh, fusion. Uh, we had to understand that ABLE was a kinase. We had to show that this fusion protein caused the disease, the kinases could be inhibited with ATP analogs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, I think the stuff on the left, which is the knowledge generation stuff, that, that to me is science. And then as you start to learn more and more of the rules and you're going to apply them, that gets to be more like engineering, at least to me. And maybe for that reason, the stuff on the left has usually been dominated by academia. And the stuff on the right has usually been dominated by biotech and pharma. Uh, and my friends in biotech and pharma tell me, you know, it's great when you academics want to play over here, but please don't stop doing this stuff because we can't do this stuff. You know, uh, the timelines and, and the deliverables are too uncertain. We can't do this stuff to the far left. And in fact, it's even worse because you can think of this stuff on the right being disease oriented applied research and maybe this stuff over here as disease-oriented basic research. But of course, even this stuff was made possible, if I can advance the slide, by decades of investment over here, which I call not disease-oriented basic research. This is what really enabled this, which eventually led to translation. And parenthetically, you know, there's a lot of talk about how quickly we're making progress in COVID-19, but that's because of all the investments we made over here such that when, you know, the COVID-19 virus came along, we kind of knew most of the rules and we knew some of the principles in terms of well, what genes would you target and you know, what, how would you design a vaccine, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's much, much, much too much pressure to try to justify, one, justify one's work in terms of translatability. And so that's why I wrote this a little editorial about publishing houses of brick, not mansions of straw. I think we should get back to just judging things based on uh, you know, whether they're likely to be true and robust and, and not have every last figure of every paper uh, be some attempt, some gratuitous attempt to, to link it to clinical translation. And so I think we should get back to forming sort of a symbiotic relationship with pharma where we create the knowledge and, and learn the rules and then they apply that uh, knowledge for the betterment of uh, patients. Uh, I'm going to end with two other uh, philosophical musings. Uh, so one is, this is our, the first slide I showed you, the paper by Treacher Collins. Uh, and you might say, well, why did it come to be known as von Hippel-Lindau disease? Well, here was the paper by von Hippel. Now he was a German ophthalmologist, so it's perhaps not surprising that he published in a German, uh, in a German language journal. Uh, but Arvin Lindau uh, was a Swedish and he published in a, a German uh, language journal as well. And that's because this was the great descriptive era in medicine. And if you could only publish in one literature and only read one literature, uh, it was the German uh, literature. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I studied German in high school in the 70s because I was told if you wanted to go into, uh, into science and medicine, you should learn German. And when I was a medical student, I once had a professor tell me, if you thought you had a new clinical observation, you should take a sabbatical and read the German literature uh, from the late 19th century and early 20th century, because what you had seen was almost certainly already described in the German literature. So the irony is Treacher Collins got penalized for publishing in an English speaking uh, journal. Uh, the, the Germany was dominant in biomedicine, uh, but of course, due to the uh, horrific events in the middle of the last century, uh, German science never really uh, recovered. And so I, I, I tell you this because there's no rule that societies always continue to go in a good direction. They can also go backwards. And so I've been trying to lend my voice to those who are concerned about the attack on science that we've witnessed, especially over the past uh, four years and, the, and, and that the road we might have found ourselves on. And hopefully uh, we can start to change uh, course here. And then finally, to end on a happy note uh, for the students, uh, my, my very first laboratory experience was uh, when I was a junior in college at Duke University. I worked in a chemistry lab on a project with sort of an absentee mentor in a dysfunctional laboratory. Uh, my project was uninteresting, unimportant, and undoable. 
And then to make matters worse, I had the audacity during my last lab meeting to correctly say that this project, which had started seven years before I entered the lab, was really based on an artifact and would never be brought to completion. Uh, so to reward me, he, uh, my professor gave me a C minus, which for a pre-med is like having a wooden stake driven through your heart. Uh, and then as an added punitive flourish, he wrote in the transcript of my, co uh, my college transcript that Mr. Kalen appears to be a bright young man whose future lies outside the laboratory. And uh, I share this with the young people because it's almost certain that at some point in your career, uh, you're gonna get knocked down uh, and maybe someone won't believe in you. Uh, and you have two responses. Uh, one is you can wallow in self-pity uh, or you can use this as motivation and hopefully show that they were wrong. And I can tell you uh, at the time I was tempted to wallow in self-pity uh, because for example, the C minus had the expected chilling effect on some of my medical school applications. Thank goodness Duke still took a chance on me. Uh, but in the end, it turned out okay. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. So I think what worked yesterday that we can try again uh, is if people would like to input their questions into the chat window, like that's probably the easiest approach. I guess while we wait, I have a quick question. Uh, in terms of the knowledge base that you were describing therapeutically, what is your take on drug repurposing and some of the serendipity behind that? Yeah, no, I, I think if you mean by that, uh, for example, doing phenotypic screens with right. chemicals with at least uh, thought of as, as having known functions and, and getting interesting phenotypes and then doing the work to show that either that phenotype really was due to the known activity of the drug, or maybe in some cases will reflect some, some new activity, maybe some other target we didn't know about, you know, maybe some fortuitous off-target effect, for example. You know, I, you know, I, think, that's, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. But you know, I think you know, more broadly, whatever the approach, whether it's repurposing chemicals, whether it's doing CRISPR screens, et cetera, et cetera, as we talked about yesterday, mm -hmm. I actually think the pharmaceutical and biotech company is really good if you provide them high quality, actionable, information, but as I discussed yesterday, they are wallowing in things that are either not completely true or true only under a very narrow set of conditions, that is to say, are not very robust. So I think we have to just do a much better job. Mm -hmm. All right. One brave soul has decided to submit a question so far. So do you have any idea of what drives the acquisition of the loss of the second allele in germline mutation carriers of VHL? You mentioned no difference in HIF axis. Could you prevent renal and other cancers in VHL or those at increased risk of RCC by targeting whatever the heterozygous defect is? Yeah, several great questions. So my thought here is colored a lot by my work on the RB gene. Uh, so I think the prevailing wisdom is that the loss of the remaining wild type allele is simply a stochastic event, which frankly, in a lot of cells and tissues is probably not tolerated. So for example, one of the questions Al Knudsen used to always ask me uh, was why is retinoblastoma retinoblastoma? You know, for example, RB is thought to be this master cell cycle regulator. Why, why the eye tumors and not other types of tumors? And I think part of the answer is almost certainly that most cells actually don't like to lose RB and don't tolerate it. And I'm sure the same is true for BHL. In fact, we know that's true. Most cells do not like biallelic inactivation of VHL. So it's only a, a, a rare cell types, including specific cells in the kidney that will tolerate uh, VHL loss. So I, I think it's stochastic. I might be wrong on that, but that's what I think. Uh, uh, in terms, I think it's a very intriguing idea to target cells that are heterozygous for VHL as a uh, chemo preventative strategy. Now, of course, you couldn't do that in the VHL setting because every, every cell would presumably have the same defect, but it's a very intriguing idea with respect to sporadic kidney cancers. But there, I think the challenge is, again, to a first approximation, there is no phenotype of having only a single VHL allele. So I, I'm not even sure what the basis for, would be for uh, selectivity. So in the meantime, what I'm very hopeful about are the HIF2 inhibitors, which are reasonably well tolerated. 
And so there you could start to imagine in certain high risk settings, such as in BHL disease, using the HIF2 inhibitor as a chemo preventative strategy. Uh, and so that's something I have my eyes open to. Great. So the next question, I wonder if germline VHL null have any impact on the transcription factor regulating hematopoiesis during embryogenesis? And do VHL null red blood cells, macrophages, or neutrophils function normally? Yeah, that sort of relates a little bit to the, to the previous question. So uh, to, to a first approximation, there, there is no phenotype that I'm aware of uh, for being VHL heterozygous, meaning uh, plus over minus. Uh, most cells do not like being VHL null. So yes, there would be a phenotype. In most cells, for example, uh, in most cells, paradoxically, you see an anti-proliferative effect. If you knock out VHL, uh, actually in most cells, what HIF does is it kind of puts you into a state of hibernation where you're trying to conserve energy because you don't have enough oxygen and the cells don't uh, proliferate very well. Uh, and there could also be indirect effects on differentiation. So I don't know about these specific examples listed here, such as macrophages and neutrophils, but I can almost assure you there would be a phenotype of being VHL null uh, in those cells. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Do individuals slash populations with more quote unquote robust or responsive HIF transcriptional programs, e.g. communities that live at higher altitudes, have a higher susceptibility for developing diseases such as kidney cancer? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I guess if I'm really being honest, the short answer is no, I don't know. So let me ask, answer some slightly related questions because as soon as we started talking about stabilizing HIF with small molecules, uh, the, the, the naysayers lined up and said, well, you're just gonna cause cancer. Uh, you're just going to cause VHL disease. You're just going to cause kidney cancer. Now, this is a long and lengthy discussion why that probably won't be the case, but certainly one experiment of nature are, are people who live at high altitude. Uh, if anything, I'm told that epidemiologically, they have longer lifespans than people who live at sea level. They certainly don't spontaneously develop VHL disease by virtue of living high altitude. Uh, at worst, there have been some case reports of carotid body tumors, which is you know, integral to how you uh, sense oxygen and, and alter ventilation. And there have been a few other rare things, but they're not really a conspicuously increased risk for cancer. So I think HIP alone doesn't do it. I think it gets back to part of what I told you earlier. I, I don't think HIP alone can promote cancer. Even in the kidney cancer setting, you need multiple other mutations and many other genes. And we didn't talk about in fact, the BHL also does do some things other than regulate HIF. So, hmm. uh, I, 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 but I think to be fair to the questioner, uh, I think it could be true that in time we'll understand that polymorphisms in the HIF response uh, do modulate your risk positively or negatively for cancer and other diseases. So I think it's a good question. So I will take a leap of faith in translating the next question, but is hydroxylated protein or protein hydroxylation involved in other diseases? Well, the, the Prior to our work, uh, it was thought that hydroxylation of proline only took place in the endoplas endoplasmic reticulum. In fact, uh, one of the reviewers who tried to reject our paper uh, only wrote about a two or three line review, which was this has to be wrong because it's already known that hydroxylation of proline only takes place, takes place in the endoplasmic reticulum. But fortunately, we had a strong editor who overruled that reviewer. Uh, but, but the statement is still true. Most hydroxylation of proline occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum and the bulk of that is collagen. And so, for example, uh, the classical answer to the, to the, to, uh, the question would be scurvy. Uh, so scurvy, which is caused by vitamin C deficiency is because you need also vitamin C for the collagen prolohydroxylases to function properly. So scurvy is caused by failure to hydroxylate proline on collagen. So that would be the best example. Great. Uh, next question, is Roxidusta specific for PHD2 or does it also inhibit PHD1, PHD3 and collagen prolyl 4 hydroxylase? Okay, so we have, we have a ringer right now. We have a true answer. Yeah, it actually uh, is. There's always, there's always a couple in the car. So uh, <laughs> no, so uh, for better or worse, and we could argue both sides of that, uh, Roxidusta is not specific for PHD2. It does inhibit PHD1, 2, and 3. Uh, and I don't know yet whether that's really a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, for, certainly for sustained production, you'd want to inactivate all three. But frankly, the way it's being dosed currently, which is orally three times a week, the drug is still being given a chance to wash out and you're still resetting, which again, I think also maybe speaks to the safety issue. But since Ron's an expert, I will point out 
that fortuitously, however, roxadustat does not inhibit that highly related, uh, or I should say that, that other regulator of HIF, FIH, that I only mentioned in passing. And, that's, uh, and that turns out to be probably important in terms of the ability to turn on EPO, but not to turn on things like VEGF. Maybe one final question. Do the HIF stabilizing inhibitors of prolohydroxylases inhibit the collagen processing enzymes with effect on extracellular matrices? Yeah, so there, there, there has been, I believe, a successful attempt to dial out the collagen prolohydroxylases. So to my knowledge, these are specific for the HIF prolohydroxylases relative to the collagen prolohydroxylases. Uh, I suspect for the reason hinted at here that you wouldn't start to, you, you wouldn't want to start in, in, uh, affecting the extracellular matrix as an off-target effect of your drug. So that was dialed out. But I should point out that there are about 70 enzymes in this super family of so-called two oxygenate dependent dioxygenases. So it could be the case that roxadest that does inhibit some other members of the family, but I, I don't believe that the collagen prolohydroxases are inhibited. Great. So, sorry, one more. Uh, so we focused on HIP-1 alpha degradation as a regulatory step. Is there variation or regulation at the production rate of the protein? Uh, good question. The answer is yes. So. Uh, because HIF-1 alpha is turning over so rapidly, it's exquisitely sensitive to both changes in degradation, but also changes in synthesis. And so, for example, if you want to downregulate HIF-1 alpha, one thing you can do uh, in many cell types is block uh, mTOR, and you'll decrease the rate of translation of HIF-1 alpha. HIF-1 alpha is very sensitive to mTOR inhibitors. Uh, but more generally, a cautionary note for the students is precisely because HIF-1 alpha is turning over so rapidly, uh, lots of other noxious things will make HIF-1 alpha disappear before typical loading controls such as actin and tubulin. So if you read a paper about a HIF-1 degrader or a HIF-1 antagonist, keep that in mind as a potentially uninteresting explanation for what the Western bot is showing you. Great, well, if there's no other questions, again, if we can, as best as possible in this setting, thanks uh, Professor Kalin again for another outstanding seminar. Thank you so much for, for joining. Thank you for the invite. Thank you, my pleasure.